Thank you. Please take a seat and we would like to continue our conference, uh, which is uh, today's last panel entitled The United States in the Cold War. Uh, I want to introduce myself as uh, I'm not the originally planned chair who has a uh, personal emergency issue uh, and couldn't be here, so I replace him. Uh, my name is Janos Kemény. I'm a senior research fellow here at the Cold War History Research Center. I was one of the first uh, coordinators of the Cold War Center back in the 2010s, and so that's how I ended up here uh, with you today. Uh, I've uh, done a lot of research. Uh, uh, recently also on uh, Cold War related topics, but today I want to introduce you to three uh, young researchers whose uh, uh, work we are going to hear about today. So first of all, uh, or, or first in line is uh, Alexandra Southgate, uh, whose presentation is entitled Bowties and Beauty Queens, Gender Perform Performance in Canadian Foreign Policy Efforts in the Early Cold War. Our next presenter will be Maxim uh, Mini. Min. Min. Sorry. Oh, no, <laughs> okay. Whose uh, presentation's title is uh, "Exploiting Every Possible Weakness: The Long Road Towards uh, the Ratification of the Panama Canal Treaties." And our third presenter will be uh, Zachary uh, Burdett. Yep. Never. Okay. <laughs> Thanks. Uh, Three, and his presentation is entitled Trading with the Potential Enemy, How uh, States Manage Economic Ties with Security Competitors. So we don't waste any more time. I want to uh, give the word to uh, Alexandra, and the floor is yours. Thank awesome. You. Thank you. And thank you so much to the organizers, including the Open Society Archive, the Wilson Center, and Corvinus University. I really appreciate it. Uh, being here like a few other people. This is my first in-person conference due to COVID and everything, um, and it's wonderful to be in this great city. Um, so, in the 1950s and 1960s, the Canadian Department of External Affairs, or DEA, as I'll refer to it in this presentation, published an in-house satirical magazine entitled Externally Yours. That was open to submissions from any staff member, and it included included descriptions of missions abroad, comical sketches and songs, and general updates about the department. At the time, it was common practice for the DEA to prepare a package of reports for staff members abroad, and the journal was included in that package, as well as being distributed to staff members in Ottawa. One comical sketch from the March 1956 edition of Externally Yours, entitled Sir John A. Joins the External Affairs Christmas Party, depicts a vivified statue of the first Prime Minister of Canada, John A. Macdonald, commenting on the significant number of women in the civil service and questioning their ability to be good diplomats. In response to his taunts, the girls, as they're always referred to, proved their diplomatic prowess by seducing a diplomat into signing a treaty. In an excerpt with stage directions that I'll read from now, um, quote, the girls look at each other, the light dawns and they do a quick strip from jeans or other unfeminine attire to something more fetching, while the record player comes out with something sexy and Latin American. The diplomat is dragged in by force and comfortably installed with cushions, etc. One female lovingly puts slippers on his feet. Another offers him food and drink. A third ruffles his hair. Fourth and fifth shimmy. Then all sing a song called Ain't He Sweet. Oh, watch our stuff. If intelligence ain't enough, we'll fraternize, glamorize, completely dazzleize that poor tough. Oh, ain't he sweet. Oh boy, he's just our meat. With womanly wiles and feminine guile, that treaty will be complete. At end of the song, two, in two install cells in laugh. Third puts pen in his mouth. Fourth holds trade treaty, and he signs. At this, all kiss him and usher him out. Although this is published in a satirical magazine, obviously for comedic effect, the image of the female seductress was nonetheless integral to the DEA's conceptualization of Canadian diplomacy in the early <coughs> Cold War, even as the influx of women into the department complicated the gender dynamics and the culture at the time. In this presentation, I'll discuss the use of gender discourse in the DEA in order to highlight the importance of gender performance for Canadian foreign relations in the early Cold War. Ultimately, this understanding of gender performance 
makes it clear that heteronormative gender roles are simultaneously foundational for government institutions and foreign policy and constantly renegotiated and changing. Feminizing language was integral to Canada's self-image during this time. Canadian politicians accepted their position as a feminized country, but at the same time wanted to be viewed as an equal and trusted partner of the United States. For example, in a, in a speech to the National War College, then Secretary of State for External Affairs, Lester B. Pearson, who would a few years later become the Prime Minister of Canada, essentially asks that Canada be consulted before the United States announces new policy initiatives concerning nuclear weapons. He ends this speech by, state, by stating, quote, our relationship is much like that between a man and his wife. Sometimes it is difficult to live with her. At all times, it is impossible to live without her. In the 1950s, Canadian officials were intensely insecure about what their role would be in the emerging Cold War order and whether they would be active participants participants in international institutions. In his 1973 memoir, Pearson continues this idea and writes that, quote, we did not want to be alone with our close friend and neighbor, the United States. As a debutante on the world stage, we were worried not about rape, but seduction. It is important to emphasize that the use of feminized language is not a non-normative shift to a new or different conception of the state nor is it a proto-feminist articulation of female power. Rather, the conceptualization of Canada as a feminine country worked firmly within the confines of heteropatriarchy and relied on the, logic, on the logic of gender binary. Essentially, it was because Canada was relatively powerless that Pearson and his staff viewed the country as female in order to, quote, appear to be kinder, gentler, softer, and more feminine, and thus appear to be less threatening and less self-interested. Pearson makes it clear that it is through diplomacy and the DEA that Canada will be able to secure this position. Canadian officials frame Canada as one half of a heterosexual partnership with the United States, and behind the scenes, the DEA worked tirelessly to enforce behavior that fell appropriately within the gendered expectations of a Foreign Service employee. The most obvious way that Canada that the most obvious way that gender was regulated in the department was through the employment of women. Even though seduction and womanly wiles was considered a benefit to Canadian representation abroad, those in the department were intensely concerned with the performance of appropriate gender roles for their employees and with limiting the role of women in the department. Women had first been recruited to work in the Ottawa offices during the Second World War because of the lack of available men. And post-war, the department decided that it would be unfair to officially preclude women from holding officerships and to demote women who had been promoted during the war. The DEA avoided making any official decision about promoting women to foreign service officers or FSOs in the years immediately after the war in order to prioritize regularizing the positions of male wartime temporary staff and to recruit men who had served overseas. By September of 1946, quote, these two reasons for delay were no longer valid and debates began in the personnel department on how to go about opening the FSO examinations to women. A quotia was suggested in order to limit the number of women admitted, with a suggestion that, quote, 2% of the Foreign Service staff should be women, gradually increasing to 7% in 35 years. <laughs> in 1947, the officer exam was open to women for the first time, although calls for applicants were kept purposefully vague so as to not actively encourage women to apply. For example, the personnel department considered limiting female applicants applicants to FSO grade two, a grade to which the DEA had no intention of making new appointments at that time. As well, the actual appointment of officerships was extended only to women who were already working within the DEA, which was in contrast to men who were generally recruited right out of university or out of graduate programs in Ottawa. This meant that the DEA could at the same time avoid hiring too many women and, def and also deflect any potential criticism of discriminatory hiring practices. Even when women did manage to get promoted within the department, they faced intense scrutiny over appropriate gender performance. Women in the department were often accused of being overly masculine, partially because the women who did manage to be promoted within the system often did so because of their ability to perform a masculinized gender and were seen as exceptionally different from the regular women in the office. One FSO, Agnes McCloskey, stated that she always signed off all correspondence as K.A. McCloskey in order to avoid, quote, 
using a meek sign off like Agnes and do not correct people when they address letters to dear sir. Tricks such as this allowed women in the department to be taken seriously by male colleagues, but they were also cause for suspicion and the women in the DEA gained a reputation for not being very feminine in comparison to the women working in other offices in Ottawa. In order to dispel this notion, women working in the department participated in the Ottawa-wide Miss Civil Service competition. Alongside the comical stories in External Yours, such as the one I read earlier, there was the announcement of Miss External Affairs, a dubious honor given to the woman who would go on to re represent the DEA at the Night of Stars, during which Miss Civil Service was crowned from within all of the offices in Ottawa. The Miss External Affairs contest was conducted by the Department Recreation Organization, and it was not an inconsequential event. Indeed, the contest was sanctioned by the heads of the DEA. In 1954, for instance, Pearson himself presented the winner with her prize. And in 1961, the contest was judged by Evan Gill, Assistant Undersecretary, and Marcel Cadeau, Deputy Undersecretary, who would go on to replace Pearson as Secretary of State only a few years after this. The performance of appropriate femini femininity was a tightrope walk for women in the DEA, but they were not alone in having intense gendered expectations associated with their work. Even as the women working in the department were literally performing for their male colleagues, the men were also enacting their own performance of masculinity. In the same play where the women seduce the diplomat, there's an extended fashion show scene where male DEA officers show off comical clothing required for various situations. This includes rubber boots for a tropical location, mittens for Greenland, and a barrel for the lean years in Ottawa when the officer has no posting abroad. Every costume features the same blue and white polka dot bow tie, and the final full dress uniform of a Canadian FSO looks like a waiter in tails, black waistcoat, blue and white polka dot bow tie, towel over arm, droopy mustache, and hair parted in the middle. Clothing was particularly important for FSO stationed abroad because they were required to spend a certain amount of time entertaining. And according to the personnel department's guide, quote, they have represent representational duties at our missions outside Canada. And it is important that they should be better dressed than in Ottawa. A clothing budget was included in the budget for international missions. And there are numerous guides discussing appropriate dress and behavior. In the 1950s, pinstripe suits, polka dot bow ties, fussy personalities, and interest in art were comical truisms of the diplomatic field. By the 1960s, however, they were recategorized as markers of male homosexuality. This included, this was in the official policies. Sorry, this was in the official policies, but also the discursive formulation of gender identity in the, general, in the civil service overall. In order to find subversive personalities in the department, a series of pseudoscientific tests were administered in what, is, what was called the fruit machine. One of the many tests was a true and false questionnaire requiring participants to answer such questions as, I think I would like the work of a garage mechanic, and the average person is not able to appreciate art and music very well. You can see how these questions would be a trap for a diplomat who obviously does not like the work of a garage mechanic and is required <laughs> to like art and music as part of his job. DE, the DEA had strict gender performance codes in the early 1950s, and by the 1960s, during the Lavender Scare, the, the same performance of masculinity became suspect, and many men lost their jobs and were publicly humiliated during the Lavender Scare. The desire to ensure that the men in the department were sufficiently masculine had serious consequences in this Lavender Scare. Historians such as David Johnson have argued that the Canadians were motivated primarily by pressures from the Americans but this isn't true. Canadians had their own fears of gender subversion, which included lo looking weak on the world stage and looking too feminine. Although the La Lavender Scare affected men from all areas of the civil service, the DEA was of the highest priority. As the minutes of, of a 1958 security panel state, and had to consider character weakness, not only as a security problem, but also from the point of view of Canadian representation abroad. Thus, the Canadian iteration of the Lavender Scare focused on how Canada would be perceived <coughs> internationally. And you can see, as you can see, the role of gender in the DEA was constantly changing and was usually contradictory. Canada was at the same time saying that, Amer that Canada is a feminine country that's seducing the world and also firing male employees that are too feminine and not sufficiently masculine. 
Just as the girls seduce the diplomat and Sir John A. joins the external affairs Christmas party, Canadian diplomats made their post-war debut in international affairs with the goal of seducing the world at large, even as leaders of the department were concerned about the gender subversion of their employees. This gender discourse was more than rhetorical posturing and had material consequences for the men and women working in the DEA. Ottawa as a whole, and the DEA in particular, was a highly mediated space where employees' personal lives and identities became wrapped up in domestic and foreign policy. The performance of very specific gender roles within the department mirrored the higher level discourse of Canada's role in the international community. In this way, gender becomes integral to understanding Canadian diplomacy in the early Cold War. Thank you. Thank you. So mm -hmm. I'd like to ask Maxim to give us his presentation. The floor is yours. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Oh, shit, he wasn't here. Okay. <laughs> Interesting. Sorry. Okay, we're going to move back. Okay. Uh, hi, everyone. It's a pleasure to be here. Um, and it's a good time for me like to take back my suit after like uh, COVID. Finally, I can wear it again. Um, so uh, thank you like for to the organizers and uh, especially to uh, the Cold War Archives Research Institute. I'm really uh, happy like to be with my fellow colleague from CWAR because it has been like delightful to be in this beautiful city with beautiful people and enjoying like a lot of food. I took a lot of kilograms, but it's good. Uh, I have some margins. Um, and thank you like to the uh, um, Open Society Archives, uh, it was like uh, really good like to be treated as like a sort of like royalty with all of these boxes and you know it was it was really good like to be in this room and just like going through files and going through uh, finally you know not like virtual archives but really like you know I, you're a historian you know how, how we feel like in uh, in archives. So today I will go like uh, in another part of uh, uh, this globe, uh, not like talking fully like about the Cold War, sorry guys, um, but I hope like you will uh, stay with me. Uh, so this like presentation today, it's like really me scratching like, the surface, the results are really like scratching the surface of a uh, problem, which is uh, exploiting every possible weakness, the long road towards the ratifications of the Panama Canal treaties. I love caricatures, sorry, I'm completely biased. Uh, you can see like Jimmy Carter offering to the leader of Panama, Omar Torridos, uh, the Panama uh, Canal, so it's basically a big chicken. Um, and like the, the sort of like steam looks like Panama and uh, the canal. So the, the, the person like was really, uh, really good at that. And I'm sorry I put like June 1st, but it's uh, May 31st. Anyway, so in 1978, Saul Linovitz, that you've been seeing like for the last like uh, 20 minutes, uh, was not like at the, was not a pageant contestant, was not Canadian, uh, was the US co negotiator for the new Panama Canal treaties. Uh, he stated that, uh, quote, the canal runs not through the center uh, of Panama, but through the center of the Western hemisphere, which is basically the American continent. Uh, indeed, the problem significantly affects the relationship um, between this country and the entire third world, since the nations of the third world have made common cause on this issue, looking upon our position in the canal as the last vestige of a colonial past which evokes bitter memories and deep animosities. If I get like too excited about Panama Canal, I'm sorry about that. So Linovitz's words, like for, in my understanding, like reflect a more complex and multilateral nature of the negotiations and ratification of a new agreement between Panama and the United States. It's not like solely a U.S. Panama problem, but it's also like a regional issue. And the main question for me uh, that is at stake, and Homer Simpson is joining us, like for that, uh, is like to it's it's basic questions, but I think they are like fundamental. It's what, what is at stake for Latin American countries regarding the Panama Canal, uh, but also what are the risks for the Carter administration at that period of time? Um, again, basic, simple questions, but I think in that sense, I see the Panama Canal treaties and especially its negotiations plus the ratification process as an inter-American Rubik's cube. That's why I have like Homer Simpson. Uh, it's the only episode, by the way, who was smart, if you remember this one. He was like, he had like a sort of like pen and his, uh, any, anyway. Uh, so for me, like it goes beyond like any kind of 
of bilateral relations. And I look at this as like priority given to the Panama Canal treaties at that period of time uh, by Carter using a sort of like joker or political like, um, I would say, uh, a good period of time for him like to push uh, for uh, such a controversial uh, issue. It's a symbol of a new chapter in the hemispheric uh, relations, especially in terms of like morality in US foreign, foreign relations. It's navigating, and it's not a pun here because we're in a, in a canal, uh, navigating a new phase of the Cold War, especially in the post-Vietnam and the fall of Saigon in 1975. And also it's an issue like of sovereignty for Latin American countries, plus an, in, I mean, a willingness from Latin American countries to, to see a reduction of US intervention. And the big question after that is like, what about Cuba? Uh, it's not about like the cigars, but the place of where uh, Fidel Castro is. And for more on that, I want like to give you like some few details, but I don't want like to bother you uh, with all of this. For more than five decades, what you have like to understand, it's like basically the canal was taken by the United States uh, from like the hand of a new, uh, newly independent uh, Panama. And basically the US like refused for like decades like to uh, renegotiate any kind of like, you know, issue of sovereignty and didn't want like to give back like the canal. And despite like some modification of the 1903 treaty uh, in 36 and 1955, uh, but again, no question about like the sovereignty. No, no, like the w Washington didn't want like this. And it led, especially in the period of like the Cold War in the beginning, some anti-American like sentiment would led also like to riot in 1964 that you can see here, um, who basically like some students like, you know, tear down like the uh, Star Spangled Banner, like the American flag. Um, and put like the Panamanian uh, flag on on the canal zone, uh, and of course, what the what are the Americans do? Shoot them, uh, which like was problematic at that period of time for the Johnson administration. In 1968, this man on the right, Omar Torrijos, the smaller one, like not like the tallest one, um, became like the Panamanian leaders. And Washington doesn't know exactly: is he communist? Is it is he like a sort of like dictator like Pinochet? We don't know exactly, but he's like a sort like of chameleon. And if you're interested in this guy, he's a weird guy. Um, and there was like a long fight of foreign negotiations. And that's why like in the 70s, there is like a renegotiation that started in 1973 and 1974, um, especially because Torrijos used basically a UN Security Council in Panama City to say it's time for the US to just to get out, get out of like our country, give us back our canal. And Richard Nixon, who was not interested at that period of time, but he was like freehand because of uh, the end of like the Vietnam War, kind of, uh, basically appointed on the advice of Henry Kissinger, uh, Ellsworth Brunker that you can see like right here, who is like a, a Vietnam veteran, like in terms of ambassador, and who is like, was considered like as hawkish. Um, and so like the negotiations were not like fructuous and even like under like Nixon and Ford, it didn't work because of opposition, especially it's strong opposition after like uh, the Watergate uh, that like the presidency, especially Ford was not able like to do anything about this. And enter our like peanut farmer here, um, Jimmy Carter, who basically had like a sort of like, wanted like to put like morality uh, really like at the center of everything. And you have like this kind of, uh, I would say like two vision of like what happened like to US foreign policy. You have like our dear Phyllis Schlafly, um, who basically at some point thought like with other like conservatives that it was like a pattern of surrender, especially after like the uh, post Vietnam war. And even like said that like, look, if we go, if we give back like, our canal, American canal, uh, we are in this pattern of surrender. We are gonna have like a second Vietnam defeat, not a second Vietnam per se. And you have like Senator Frank Church, who is like, who became under Carter, uh, the uh, chairman of the Senate Foreign Relations Committee. And he said like, if we are going to exercise real influence in the world, it is going to be based upon our moral position. It's going to be based on, upon our moral power, even more than upon military power. So why Panama? Because it's time just like to get out and just to, to set like the, to push like the reset button, uh, especially after like intensive like decades during the Cold War as you probably know, your Cold War is starting, so I don't have to go through details. But the problem became that like there's two treaties at that period of time were negotiated. One was like, we give back your canal, I mean our canal, 
that period of time. Our canal, like in, at the beginning of uh, 2000, and uh, we have like a second canal, which is like neutrality treaty. And we, United States, are able like to defend the canal, militarily speaking. And it created like immense tension at that period of time. Romulo Escobar Bethancourt, who is right here on the right, like even say like, no, 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 we didn't agree on those things. And there is like even like some tensions on the U.S. Senate floor to say, what is your understanding like between Panama and the U.S. regarding neutrality and the defense? How do we maintain our security interests at that period of time? And like the tension even like went over like to Carter, like to say, well, we have like to make sure that we can we can ratify the canal as soon as possible. And they were able like to have like a sort of like understanding and clarification and sign like a what we call like a, a statement of understanding regarding this neutrality thing. And senators were probably like happy with that. Not Latin American countries, because I want like to explain that right now. Um, in Latin American countries, it uh, give like a lot of reaction. You have like President Perez of Venezuela, who is here. You have Senator uh, Howard Baker, who is like the minority leader a Republican in the Senate. And you have like Senator Lloyd Benson from Texas. If you don't remember him, think about like when he clashed with Quell uh, during a vice presidential debate. And he said, I knew Jack Kennedy. Jack Kennedy was my friend. Sen uh, uh, Senator, you're not like Jack Kennedy. That's him. And during like a meeting, like in on January 13, 1978, according like to the uh, U.S. ambassador, then uh, uh, sorry, in, in 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 Caracas at that period of time, Vaki, um, he saw like there was a big tension between the guys, especially with Baker. And Perez, that you see here, uh, said like, look, don't look at just like your problem in the U.S. You forgot like a half of the equation. And even like went th further, like with all of this tension uh, on the Senate floor saying we don't want like to give back the canal, he said there was a limit to what Panamanian would accept. And that was the real political question rather than when whether Torreros was flexible or not, regardless of what Torreros was willing to do, there were limits to what he could, Torreros, deliver. And B Baker like became extremely upset because Perez has strong ties with, uh, with Torreros. And even Vaki said, we have to keep Perez on our side to make sure that he can be like a good intermediary like person between us and Torreros if things like go ugly. Another person that I want like to uh, emphasize on uh, is here, President uh, Lopez Murchison of um, Colombia. Thank you. I had like a blank. Thank you, Daniel. Um, and on the top, you have like Jorge Eliezer Gaitan who was assassinated in 1948 uh, when he was like running for president. Okay. Mm -hmm. um, and so during like the 30th anniversary of his, uh, of his um, assassination, uh, Alfonso Lopez, and again, like all of this quotes like come from telegrams sent by US ambassadors to uh, Washington. Lopez Mirchesen was extremely upset about this, especially like during the 30th anniversary of, um, of the as, uh, assassination of uh, Gaetan. And he felt that a, a reservation in a Senate called the Decontini Reservation, who could uh, allow uh, in March 1978, the United States to intervene militarily, but also like internally in Panamanian affairs, um, the US ambassador like uh, a cable like directly after like uh, Lopez Michelson's uh, speech. And Mitchison like felt that the decontinued reservation contravened the Rio Treaty and the OAS Organization of American States Charter regarding non-intervention. And even Mitchison went even like further. Uh, uh, in front of like a crowd that gathered uh, for this anniversary, uh, he said, how can it be that when we commemorate the end of the United States unilateral intervention in our country, a North American Senate uh, extremely condescending amendment to the Panama Canal treaties, which confirmed the autonomy and sovereignty of Panama, seeks to protocolize again after 30 years, uh, sorry, uh, protocolize again after 30 years, the North American right to intervene in our territories. And he went on and said, it cannot be justified that today under the pretext of assuring like transit through the canal or tomorrow under the pretext of combating the drug traffic or after tomorrow in the name of human rights, against one ideology or another, one nation unilaterally acquires the right of intervention. Basically, it was like foreseeing 
this intervention that will occur in 1989. And uh, intense like uh, tension, uh, especially during the Reagan administration. Um, the other like problem, and I hope I still have, I still have time, I think. The other problem was another like cautious calculation from Cuba and the US. So where is the priority here? You have like uh, the United States uh, um, interest like section that was opened in 1977 in the uh, embassy of Switzerland. And here you have like Toreros and Castro. The problem like was that we didn't want at that period of time Cuba to take too much space at that period of time and remain quiet because the presence of Cuba during the negotiation, even like just a whisper, would have like antagonized many, many US senators who were like, of course, anti-communist. And even like Castro sent like a message. There was like a reestablishment uh, at some point, like negotiations between Cuba and the United States to reestablish like a sort of like relations. Uh, and as I said, like this uh, US interest like section in the embassy of Switzerland. And basically he sent like a, a, a message that was relayed both by Toreros and also like by Frank Church. And Castro's expected the process of normalizing relations between Cuba and the US to be suspended because of the Canal Treaty negotiations and its priority. He did not have any problems with that. And indeed he believes that the Canal Treaty is of such great importance to the atmosphere that he's willing to wait until it is ratified. Sorry, I was seeing that three more minutes. Three more minutes? It's, it's fine. I can wrap up that. Um, and the problem is like many uh, ambassadors at that period of time, and especially the US interest section like chief uh, in uh, the uh, uh, embassy of Switzerland was saying, we see like there is a willingness from, uh, from Cuba to just like put our like negotiations like aside, Cuba, US. But on the other hand, we don't know exactly what are the calculations. And it's my hope that if I go to Cuba, I'm allowed to, uh, I will be able like to uh, find some answers. But what I can tell you right now, it's what I found also in the Open Society Archives, and I'm extremely grateful for that. Uh, it's a quote like that was uh, from the Panama Canal Treaty signals of U US policy in the Americas in the Baltimore Sun, a uh, few days like after like the treaty was signed. And this, um, um, this journalist uh, 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 emphasized on the necessity, like on, on the good signals of those, uh, those treaties, sorry, I'm stumbling, um, of those treaties like for Latin America, uh, Latin America and also like the US. And even like quoted, and I will spare you with that, uh, 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 a diplomat like from Argentine, but most importantly, he emphasized on what Latin America and the US have to lose if like the ratification process fell. And again, just like for your information, just one vote, uh, 68 versus like 32, uh, and the ratification was, was approved for both treaties. And he said this, both, so United States and Latin America, Latin America have much to lose if the, if, if, if the treaty is not ratified by a two third vote in the Senate when it is put to the final test earlier, uh, early next year, so 1978. For the administration, Carter administration, its entire diplomatic authority would be put into questions, at least briefly, and its stature south of the border would be all but destroyed. For the Latin Americans, the prospect of better relations with the promise of increased trade and investment would be shattered. And the sense of bitter, bitter disillusionment sorry, could unleash violence in Panama and produce serious diplomatic repercussions elsewhere. Thank you for your attention. Thank you very much, Zachary. The sure. floor is yours. I have some slides. Let me see if we can uh, figure out where it's gone. Um, okay. No, thanks. Did you say you uh, some here? No. Okay, we downloaded them somewhere. But, uh, oh, no. That's And this is download yeah. and uh, all right. Well, it doesn't seem to have worked out. That's okay. All right, that will work. 
Um, all right, so I'm going to start a timer since I know we're at the end. And so the one, one promise you'll get from this is that I'll stop talking after 12 minutes no matter what <laughs> is, is my gift. So um, I want to echo the thanks to the conveners of the conference, so Open Society Archives and, and CUR, especially Victoria, who's done a tremendous job and poured a tremendous amount of uh, effort into shepherding us along this weekend. It's been quite excellent. Um, so my topic hopefully bookends with the, the beginning uh, of the, the conference today. Of course, I paid Westad to talk about economic aspects of containment with China. Uh, and so the basic you know, uh, variation is why the United States would contain the Soviet Union and engaged with, with China in the 1990s when it was clear that that was the only country uh, that could become a, a viable peer competitor in the near term. Um, and so I'll start out uh, by previewing uh, the question and motivation behind it, uh, the argument which basically outlines four different strategies of how countries might trade with um, countries that they think they'll, they'll end up fighting a war with. Uh, and then I'll focus uh, a little bit more than I normally would, as I'm normally a political scientist, but I'm moonlighting as a historian this week, uh, on the historical case study, which is, is normally a uh, passing afterthought, but I'll try and focus a little more uh, on that. So uh, like most of my academic projects, uh, it was motivated by pettiness and frustration with, with uh, other, how others are, are covering it. Uh, and so similarly, frustration of the new Cold War analogy is describing the US-China relationship. Uh, and the, a big component that looks different in the U.S.-China relationship versus the U.S. and the Soviet Union in the early 1940s, uh, especially, uh, is the economic component and the size of the economic ties between the United States and China. Uh, and that in response to this, most of the, the analysis, both from social scientists and policymakers, is focused on this idea of economic decoupling. Uh, but what exactly that means is really unclear. Uh, so President Trump promised to decouple, but never exactly uh, clarified what that would mean. And so what the end state of that is, and uh, is, is unclear. It seems to not mean severing all trade, but what you leave, what you don't leave, what the desired end state is, uh, is, is really vague. Um, but one thing that is clear is that uh, the, the popularity of the idea of economic engagement has plummeted. Uh, and so one prominent analyst called it the worst strategic blunder any country has made in recent history. Uh, and there's no comparable historical example of this. Uh, and so this is, in my mind, a, a testable hypothesis and what I think is, is clearly wrong. Um, and so uh, the, you know, one, one case of the project focuses, focuses on the Anglo-German relationship before World War I, where trade between England and Germany doubled in those preceding 10 years. And in that same time, the, the English doubled the size of the home fleet, the naval presence near uh, the, the English Channel in preparation for a war. So two countries that were clearly preparing to fight, uh, but chose to continue trading. Um, and so the Cold War is another potential case where um, we have this vision of, of containment that was, was unlimited and there were stark economic blocks, uh, but this is a, a clipping from the OSA archives from this week from a Wall Street Journal article in the 1980s that was critical of U.S. trade policies as being far too conciliatory towards the Soviets, and that the Soviets uh, were using the Americans and American companies to grow their high-tech industry, which would in turn, they would use these dual-use commercial goods, especially in the 1980s, there was a lot of concern about fast computers, supercomputers, which now are about you know, a tenth of the quality of our iPhones, um, to, to strengthen Soviet military capabilities. And Wall Street Journal, more recently, this, this, this past couple of weeks, has reported that we found Western microelectronics and, and Russian missiles that are being used in Ukraine. Uh, and a big part of US and Western policy now is focused on denying access to those same technologies to make it harder for Russia to rebuild. And so the project, in general, is trying to take a comparative lens to see how countries have, have responded to these dilemmas before of wanting to benefit from trade but avoiding strengthening the other side and also wanting to avoid uh, provoking them too much and undermining the relationship unnecessarily for marginal gains. So uh, like all political scientists, I simplify it to a two by two and so we're professional oversimplifiers. So if you're not frustrated by this, then I'm not doing my job. Um, and so in, in the permissive economic relationship uh, and the, the top left, we have engagement. This is kind of a free for all buffet of trade in which states are not buying a lot of insurance and hedging uh, against the risk that things could go south. Uh, so it's very enthusiastic levels of trade that we saw between the United States and China in the 1990s, as we talked about this morning, with the extension to the WTO, active encouragement of, of, of foreign direct investment and, and technology transfers. And the opposite end of the spectrum is containment, as we saw it in the early component of the Cold War, where the goal was, was to contain the overall growth of the Soviet economy and to deny it access not only to strategic goods that are dual use goods that you can pretty directly put into military capabilities, but also very basic non-strategic goods of any industrial value that might help the Soviet economy grow, because in the long term, they can translate that greater industrial capacity into stronger forces just through their latent economic power and increasing the productivity of the economy. And so these are the two strategies that political scientists, to the extent they focused on this, have generally focused on. And so 
I think this misses two important middle road strategies. Uh, one is denial, that is kind of containment light. Uh, so it's the diet version of the buffet if you're worried about putting on kilograms. Uh, the denial focuses on just these strategic goods, the high-end dual-use goods like supercomputers, today semiconductors, quantum computing, artificial intelligence algorithms, the, 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 the final three, are all things the United States is limited in its trade relationship with China through new export controls to limit what they can get a hold of. Uh, this is similar to what the United Kingdom was trying to do in contrast to the United States in the late 1940s. They disagreed strongly on export controls in the United States in 1949, along with NATO partners in Japan, established the Coordinating Committee for Multilateral Export Controls, COCOM, and we actually see historically in the archives this debate play out between the United States and the United Kingdom and the disagreement about the end state, should we be denying only specific militarily useful dual-use goods, or should we just be trying to hamstring their economy writ large and get away with anything we can because war is too risky and we need to prepare for that. Finally, I think the diversification is, is kind of the more defensive insurance buying strategy where you diversify by increasing either domestically, internally, your capacity to produce these goods and, and reduce your reliance on external providers, or you look for exit options, other countries willing to funnel you this trade if your competitor won't. So today I think that China is implementing the strategy and things like the dual use circulation policy, which is explicitly justified in part on national security grounds and US collusion to deny China access to things like semiconductors, advanced semiconductors. And so China has made a tremendous, uh, one of the largest state investments in history uh, to increase its resiliency to, uh, to build that internally. So these are just indicators to tell you how we would know these strategies when we see them. I think the one thing, the key thing to take away from this is that there, the, the, what differentiates these strategies is what they stop short of doing. And so containment and denial strategies can still build in resiliency. For example, the United States is spending quite a bit of money along with Australia and others uh, to, to secure access to rare earth minerals that China currently, but not permanently or structurally has a large amount of control over while also taking some offensive measures. But what I argue it stops short of doing is trying to contain the Chinese economy writ large, right? And so we're not having debates anymore about Chinese access to soybeans, right? In the same way that we once did uh, about access to wheat and the great uh, grain robbery of, of the 1970s. Um, so just very briefly, this is most of the meat for political scientists, but for historians, right? The, uh, just generally speaking, I think there are three sets of questions countries focus on in choosing from this menu of four strategies. Uh, they ask how severe the threat is, um, because states are generally focused on the short term and, and they want to benefit from trade, right? It's, uh, they care about prosperity, both as an end in itself, also as a means to their long-term security and their industrial military power. Uh, and they don't want to provoke unnecessary competition, right? And so in general, they're going to wait until I think the threat is quite high. They're going to ask what it costs them, right? If it's extraordinarily expensive and would hurt their own long-term power position, they can't retreat from trade entirely, right? They'll lose out relative to everybody else. And they're going to ask how much they can get away with. What can they do to the other, the other side? Um, and I think if, if you think you have these big asymmetries, especially in uh, technological development, you'll try and deny them access to the, the goods that you've developed. And if you don't, you'll try and diversify and maintain as much trade as possible in tech transfers like the Chinese are, uh, while still taking, uh, buying some insurance. So uh, the, the evidence from the Cold War, uh, I think that one thing to note is there's actually significant variation over time. And I think we move from a containment strategy in the early part of the Cold War to a denial strategy later where we allow starting in the 1970s, especially 1973, a considerable amount of dual use trade that we consider non-strategic goods. Uh, and this is variation that's often missed, that it's kind of the, the economic equivalent of GATIS strategies of containment. There's been a little historical work on that I can talk about at the Q&A. Uh, but the, the key distinction is the United States and Britain are ostensibly two security partners with uh, shared cultural and, and regime type ideological backgrounds that face the same country at the same period and pick different strategies in response. The British go with the denial strategy, the Americans with a containment strategy. And quite simply, according to my argument, that we would predict that uh, the economic costs for Britain were far higher because they relied on trade as a share of national income, much more than the United States did. And within this, Great Britain relied far more uh, on trade with the Eastern Bloc in the interwar period and then trying to gain access to raw materials to, for reconstruction. Uh, after the war. And so the cost to Great Britain of foregoing non-strategic trade with the Soviet Union and the Eastern Bloc was, was far higher. So predictably, they fought to keep the list of export controls and overall trade restrictions far narrower than the United States did. And so this plays out, there are actually different lists of COCOM. Of one uh, is the strategic goods, two is non-strategic, and the British were very focused on one and not on two, and Americans wanted across the board restrictions. And so you see those debates play out. And because Britain was far weaker, this is relative share of global material capabilities, Britain is the red line, the United States is blue, and the Soviets are green, 
Uh, Britain would pay a higher cost. It didn't have a lot of breathing room, right? Because it's much weaker after the war than it used to be. And so it really would imperil its long-term security. And I don't think you have to look to ideological explanations. And I can talk more about that as a competing explanation in the Q&A um, to explain these things. If, if in fact, we see variation while ideology remains relatively consistent in these countries, the United States, for example, and Britain, we see variation in their strategies over time. We do see, though, that the British shift to containment uh, from 1950 to 1953, this is partly a response to the, the Korean War, but I, also a huge part of it is that the relative economic costs change. It was the United States passes the Battle Act legislation named after a person, not a battle, uh, in 1949, which allows it to leverage US military and economic aid on foreign compliance with US export controls. So very quickly, you start to see Western European partners who were very resistant to overall economic containment fall in line. And then at the, in, in 1953 and 1954, as the threat recedes and their relative dependence on US trade, uh, US aid at the top, and East-West trade uh, kind of converges, the economic costs and calculations as well as the threat perceptions uh, start to converge. So as a final note, this, this in part, they still opt for denial right throughout the Cold War because they have a huge relative asymmetric advantage over the, over the Soviet Union where the size and then GDP per capita of the, the US economy is in blue and the Soviets are in red. And so there's, there's a tremendous opportunity because the Soviets can't produce these goods themselves. And it's a key enabling factor uh, that enables the, the United States uh, and Great Britain to pursue denial rather than diversification, which I argue that the Soviets do, but I need to do more historical work before I can really test that. So in conclusion, I think the, the way political scientists talk about this is a binary choice of you either uh, contain and really go for the economic jugular or you go for the buffet and don't think twice. It kind of misses these key middle ground options. The yeah. Containment is rare because uh, the mode of an opportunity rarely aligned. By the time a country is threatening enough, it's rarely vulnerable. Um, and I also think we need to think about allies in the US-China case and third parties as a critical factor of this vulnerability as well as the economic costs. And that's going to, I think, perennially make it different from the US-Soviet case. I mean, we see denial going forward from both sides, especially as China becomes more uh, innovative and sophisticated in the future. But containment on either side is unlikely. Thanks. Thank you. Well, as the head of the last panel, I would like to ask the audience to ask questions. I won't because I know that everyone's time is uh, really um, expensive. So please, if you have any questions, pose them. Yes, please. I can begin with the first Alex, wonderful picture. We have nothing yes. to say to them. I really like the Alex. <laughs> Thank you. Uh, I have no questions to say to us. As opposed to the two of you. I would expect nothing less, Daniel. <laughs> uh, so for Marx, I, I really enjoyed the presentation. I think you're right that you know by zooming out from the US and Panama and joining in Latin America, you're getting a much richer picture. But what seemed clear to me is that if you want to get an even richer picture, the G77 would be the kind of outer ring to try to bring into the mix. Because what Lopez Michelson is doing, but especially what Castro is doing, is trying to really get the non-aligned on board with the position of Panama. And, and your US, US sources confirm it. So I mean, I know you have a lot on your plate, and I do wish you were to Mexico and to, to Panama, but you could also fit in Yugoslavia. I think that would be really helpful. Okay. Um, for Saka, I also really enjoyed the paper. And I mean, there's not much related to this presentation, but rather to how you frame the project. I was wondering if making that kind of connection between the kind of really first world one period and this, you might need this, and let's say this, and then the rise of China nowadays, we might be missing something out of the picture, and it's the fact that investments are getting less and less reinvested back in the home country. And also, I'm thinking of the work you're doing on, for instance, offshore investments and the like, and how that changes a little bit of your narrative. And then I thought it would be interesting to think about the French example, because the French were notoriously bad in their colonial period in reinvesting back to France. They would invest all over the place, very messy, very bad. Um, so maybe that's interesting for you to think more about how much of that money actually comes back to England as compared to what was in the Cold War to the US, and what does come back now that because I think it's a very different amount of volume and capital. Well, I mean, I, mean it, I agree with that. Like the only the the prime that I that I that I have right now, like especially about Yugoslavia, is if I if I don't want like, to be nuked by a scholar, uh, is that like a, a book will be published on the non-aligned movement, for what I heard leaking information from time to time, you know, uh, that helped. Uh, but uh, yeah, I mean, I, I agree with the G77 uh, and, and the role of Lopez Mitchison. And the only problem that I have is like, 
current like political situation in um, in, in Venezuela for obvious reason. Uh, but uh, I think that like looking also at Colombia and probably the ties between the two countries would be like a good idea. We'll kill like uh, two birds with one stone. Sorry, I'm not killing birds. It's just like you know. Um, Metaphor, uh, but yeah, I will. I will definitely do that. That was like probably too much, like my explaining the expression. Go ahead. No, no, I just like the clarification. Okay, yeah, 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 yeah. <laughs> you know, go ahead. Yeah, no, I think the the reinvestment point is an interesting one. I'm, I'm, I, I don't think the English were great at this. The English had some kind of bizarre um, R and D policies. Actually, I think interestingly, the U.S. case, I've been surprised by how much reinvestment there is. Um, and so I think that one of the reasons that the the relative costs of who's benefiting more from the U.S. China relationship. Uh, is less decisive than we think because a lot of American companies benefited from lower cost manufacturing. They were able to reinvest those savings into R&D. So part of the reason the United States retains a huge R&D and in technological innovation over the Chinese is that we've actually benefited from basically using cheap labor to, to offshore that component, but onshore the technological investment and, and, and maintain that as part of our, our kind of soft knowledge economy lead. Uh, but the British case, I, I suspect you're right, is, is a peculiar one. And I, I don't know enough about that particular aspect, but it's a good thing to look into. Yes, please. Thanks, everybody. You guys did a great job. Um, I just have a question for Alex. I'd like to add Alex as the next part of the question. This is actually two questions, but they're related. And <laughs> yes, I can see you. Uh, you can hear me. Um, so one is, uh, was there any resistance that you learned about in terms of people rejecting this kind of over, um, uh, you know, forced feminist kind of, you know, overtures and clothing, and you know, was there any resistance to these these things that were happening? And then, I guess, similar, like right along the same lines, is uh, I don't know how long, how far you went with this, you know, in terms of the time period, and um, in terms of women's liberation in the 19, like in the early, like in 60s, early 70s, and if there was any direct movement that you came across, or if you looked at that to see um, in rejecting these standards and sort of how they unfolded as time went on. Mm -hmm. Yeah, those are two really good questions. There was no resistance to the gender conformity because you would lose your job and probably be blacklisted and probably have your life ruined, honestly. And especially in the case of women, if they didn't navigate these things, then you're just difficult and you don't get promoted and you don't get to stay in the department. Um, there was kind of some, like the women who participated in the beauty pageant didn't always necessarily buy into it. Like this one woman, Suzanne Barrier, who won Miss External Affairs and then lost Miss Civil Service. She wrote um, that her many years as a lawyer did not adequately prepare her for a beauty pageant. Um, so she wasn't really buying into it, and yet she also did participate. Um, so it was just kind of the thing she had to do in order to be an active member of the department. Um, and yeah, in terms of women's liberation, that came pretty late to the civil service. Like all of this lasted for quite a long time. So I don't really touch on that just because I'm mostly looking at the 50s and 60s. Um, but it is really interesting to think about, especially in the case of Canada, because now Canada uh, supposedly has a feminist foreign policy and gender parity in the cabinet. Um, so it's really interesting the way even now Canada uses feminizing language to talk about our role. But now it's, yeah, in line with feminism and women's liberation, um, although I don't think it's necessarily uh, always as, the reality isn't always as true as the feminist rhetoric that Justin Trudeau likes to use sometimes. <laughs> Thank you. Yes, please. Yeah. Uh, thank you very much to all the panelists. It was very interesting. Uh, I enjoyed uh, listening. Uh, I had a question actually to Zach about the current situation. Um, I know it's not the scope of your research, but uh, sort of having studied all these uh, theories and strategies uh, on female in denial, how would you describe or maybe classify uh, the situation relationship between the West and rationale uh, through the prism of economic sanctions and maybe anticipate how the events might unfold uh, in the future? Uh, so I think that the United States certainly seems to be trying to push for kind of an out there. There's a Part of, part of what its own policy wants to be and what it wants other countries to adopt. And so at the very least, the United States has been trying to get other countries to adopt what I would call a diversification strategy for quite a long time. Uh, reduce your reliance on, on uh, Russian energy exports. Uh, and then there's been, and that's a big part of it, is concern about being cut, in, cut off in a conflict and leveraged, right? So you want to buy some insurance against that. Uh, we finally started to see countries kind of move towards that uh, after a long time. But I think that uh, especially now we're starting to see a move, I think, <coughs> past even denial to outright containment, where there are some sectors 
that it seems like the concern is not we're cutting it off because of dual use applications to rebuilding the Russian military, but from the premise that if we hurt the Russian economy overall, it's not just bargaining leverage for Ukraine uh, or for uh, over the Ukraine issue, but in fact uh, can just weaken the Russian economy and make it harder writ large for them to produce military capabilities independent of this kind of chip or this kind of algorithm feeding into that. Um, I'm not totally read up on some of the current uh, efforts, but that's the flavor that I get from, from kind of skimming some of the headlines, is at the very least behind the scenes, my guess is that um, that that's part of our goal, and I think the, or the United States goal, and the United States has said uh, pretty publicly that, that one of its uh, aspirations is for Russia to be weakened in this conflict, and a component of that is definitively its military power, uh, which is completely unsurprising, but I think that there is uh, more and more, especially behind the scenes, kind of an economic component, uh, and that extends to latent power and just the overall industry and getting companies to pull up permanently like McDonald's, right? And, and I think that it's, that's going to be hard to roll back, uh, and especially when the, the United States is not great at subtlety in foreign policy, and so, you know, I, I think it's hard to turn those on a dime, and once we get it there, I think it's going to have, there's going to be some stickiness. So I think it's merging towards containment, uh, and that's shifted unbelievably quickly. I think, yes, we had a question in the back, please. Yeah, so a question for Alex. So I really enjoyed your paper. Um, I'm curious uh, uh, whether um, there's a, a literature, you know, uh, I know, you know about the literature on the lab and so on, but when you um, were discussing um, the, 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 the lack of gender equality, to say the least, you know, at, at, uh, in, in Indian foreign affairs ministry, whether, you know, you're finding that there are studies on the way or other states, like the U.S., I think, didn't have a woman ambassador until, like, 1948, you know, and I, I can't imagine the situation is any better. Um, and then the, the other part of this is, uh, I'm curious, I, I know that there's an emerging literature on the uh, the cost of, you know, some people call, like, talent misallocation, you know, like, what it is you're not, like, using all the human capital that's available, and people have tried to quantify this, like, you look at a law firm that might now have rough gender equality, and then you can infer like how that firm was likely underperforming when it wasn't mobilizing all the available talent. Are you interested in making arguments like that in terms of the impact this had on kind of the quality of decision making, quality of analysis? Um, sorry, I don't. What was the first part of the question? Well, the first part of it is like I want to read more. <laughs> okay. <laughs> Who else would you suggest somebody be reading? Like if they're not only interested in Canada, like if they want to read. Kind of comparable studies about other countries as well. Um, well, if you are interested in Canada, you should read Gary Kinsman and Patricia Gentile. Um, they're fantastic scholars who do talk about um, gender in Canada, which I do think is interesting. Um, there's also Margot Canada who wrote, writes about the United States. She her book, The Straight State, about how um, America is constructed as a heterosexual nation and how heterosexism is really in, inherent to politics. Um, those are two really great options. And there's also this um, Icelandic uh, historian, uh, I forget her first name, her last name is um, Igman's son. Um, there's an article about Icelandic US relations uh, during World War II and about how a very similar position to Canada, the Icelandic politicians were worried that Americans were coming in and being like aggressive men and uh, Iceland was this kind of like weak woman that was like being raped and sexually assaulted by America and this use of this language. Um, so there is quite a lot of literature um, on this, but in particular, a lot of it focuses on this rhetoric of marriage, which is like a very common way that countries uh, think about their relations, particularly with the U.S. The U.S. is almost always the man in the heterosexual relationship. But what I think these uh, studies often miss is they focus just on this marriage as being a male-female relationship and aren't thinking about it as being a heterosexual relationship and what that says about sexual politics. And they don't really apply queer theory or anything. And I think that is where these kind of feminist studies are going is thinking more about sex and sexuality and not just gender because obviously they're very connected. Um, and then the second question? It's about the impact. Like, do you want to, um, if you're not already, like, showing the, uh, the how it is that uh, the lack of diversity um, and the lack of, you know, mobilizing available talent had a negative impact on the quality of decision making and quality of analysis and so on. Yeah, I'm not. 
totally doing stuff like that, mostly because now I'm doing my PhD in the United States, so I'm talking about American uh, Cold War history now in my dissertation. Um, but I do think that that is very important. And I think what's really interesting is the way, especially in this case, there's always a double standard. One of the reason why they didn't want women was because they were worried that they'd have to either lose the woman when she gets married or then have to worry about her having children and that's extra cost if you have a mission abroad to bring the children. Um, but that was completely a double standard because in all of their personnel files, they always consider if the man is married, they consider if they have children, they won't send a male diplomat to a certain place if he has young children because it might not have good schools and stuff like that. Um, so they use that as a justification to not let women be diplomats, even though that is part of their cost analysis with male diplomats. So I think there, that is definitely part of it. And I think they use the data and the money as an excuse when it doesn't actually matter. Thank you. Um, so I was signaled that we are well above uh, our time. So. I need to close our panel for today. I think we heard three uh, great presentations, and uh, the day, uh, you know, as, as a whole was uh, really uh, interesting. I hope you all heard uh, some interesting uh, thoughts and uh, new facts that uh, will, your, will make your research uh, better. And I'd like to close today's panel. I don't know if you want to. Uh, Tell us. And, and no, first of all, we should thank the panelists. Absolutely. Uh,